Indiana Outdoor Adventures TV show is coming on and don't you know they've got a new adventure planned just for you you'll be wishing you were in the Indiana Outdoors too it may be hunting could be fishing keeping alive some old tradition from the days of long ago well head on out without a doubt with us you can go on the indiana outdoor adventures tv show welcome to indiana outdoor adventures i'm troy mccormick and no we're not outside today we're inside a manufacturing plant in terre haute called neoteric now neoteric is a, a fabricator right here in indiana making hovercrafts. Now, you wouldn't think about hovercrafts in Indiana, but these guys make all different kinds, uh, two-seaters, four-seaters, six-seaters. They make them for private use. They make them for commercial use, for military, for government, for rescue. Who knew? You know what? They even make golf carts. We're going to spend this episode learning a little bit about not only Neoteric, but all kinds of hovercrafts and what you can do with them. Well, joining us today is Chris Fitzgerald, and Chris is the founder and president of Neoteric, and we're here to find out everything we can about hovercrafts. Chris, I mean, just, let's start with the basics. What is a hovercraft and how does it work? Well, hovercraft came into existence because of the, the, the difficulty of pushing a ship through the water. It takes a lot of energy to move a ship along, and if you can lift a ship up on a cushion of air, it doesn't take as much energy. So I'll give you a really good example. This is a company flyer, but we can also use it as a hovercraft example. So if you just take an area like this and you put some air underneath it, it'll hover. And if we... Uh, do you have any money, Troy? Oh. This, is, this is how we make money Let's here. Let's see what we get here. Yeah, we, not, not dollars, we need... I need oh, no, I don't dollars. have any point. So I figured you wanted a dollar. <laughs> I would, but it, well, it's not going to work in this case. So we put some weight in the middle. Let's put a 25 cent there. Okay. It'll carry it, but if we move it around, it'll control it. See that? Make sure. It left right. So it's just like a, just like a flying machine. A little weight adds control. It's very critical. It's weight balance, and so it's not as simple as driving a jet ski or a boat. It takes some skill and it takes training, and that's what happens here. This is all the stuff that's in the background, and the theory of the hovercraft. What you just saw is basically the lift. There's the air underneath, there's the pressure, and you have the area. And that's the basic theory of hovercraft. It's as simple as that. You have, you have a motor that blows air down and out, and it creates what, positive pressure? That's what happens, yes. And the, and the pressure is very light, very small. If you look at this formula here, uh, the pressure, if you think that was your foot and you're standing on, uh, say, water, you sink. But um, if, if you're on a hovercraft, you don't sink because the pressure is so small. The pressure of your foot when you're standing in mud's about about 33 pounds per square uh, square inch, uh, whereas with the hovercraft it's only a fraction of a, of a square inch of pressure. So it's a, almost equivalent to a seagull standing on one leg. Okay. <laughs> and, and obviously, if we're floating on this cushion of air, we can go across grass and, and water and sand. And That's right. The hovercraft doesn't know what the surface is like. As okay. long as it's reasonably hard, it'll just float across the top. So if you're going across ice or snow or mud or grass, the hovercraft's really unaware of it because it's flying. Um, the, the other thing you might have noticed is that there's a skirt around the edge. And the reason that that exists, yes, it, it exists to try and contain the air underneath so that I don't have to blow as hard. So I've got to keep, I've got to keep it, It's escaping out from underneath. Right. So if I can put a seal around there, we call it a skirt because it looks like a skirt, mm -hmm. and it seals the air underneath so you don't have to blow as much, doesn't take as much energy to lift. So that's really the technology, uh, basic technology, uh, important technology is wrapped up in the design of that seal, that skirt. Now, the hovercraft, it, it kind of sets down and then rises up. You don't see it because the skirt kind of covers it. Right. If, if the skirt was clear plastic, you would actually see about a, eight How, or nine inches. Oh, that's right. Eight or nine inches off the ground. Yeah. And, that, and that depends entirely on how big the hovercraft is. If the hovercraft, there's a rule of thumb, you can't hover more than one-tenth the width. 
Otherwise, it'll fall over. So the hovercraft has to be, if it's, a, if it's 20 foot wide, you can hover two feet high. That's roughly the, or 10 foot wide, you can hover one foot, and it'll be stable. If you try to hover two feet, if you make the skirts too big, it'll fall over, it'll collapse, it won't be stable. Because there are large ships going across the English Channel ferrying people, and they're obviously bigger than... That's right, that. and they have much higher hover height. Some of them are seven feet. The hover height will be seven feet tall, okay. as high as this office roof. To get, across, to get over the waves. So they can handle big waves, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, applications here, there's a lot of rivers, there's very few rivers in Australia. But you were uh, working with hovercrafts in Australia. Yes, we were, we were manufacturing, developing them. Not, we weren't making very many, but we are primarily selling kits in Australia. And that gave us enough of a, of a sort of capital base to move to, move to the States. You know, now, we're, we're talking back mid-70s. But in reality, the modern hovercraft really didn't kind of come about until, what, the mid-50s. So you were, you were kind of on the cutting edge. Well, I mean, we started in the very beginning. Uh, the, the, the first hovercraft, the idea started in England about 1953. About 1957, uh, the late 50s, uh, there were a lot of people in, in the United States developing craft. There was a Dr. Bertelsen in the Ponce, Illinois, that actually challenged the inventor in England, who was Cockrell. And all these various people came up with the idea roughly at the same time. It was the early 60s that it started to move, and that's, that, that's when we really did a lot of the work in Australia. And by the end of the 60s, we, we were ready to move to the States. It was about 75 that we had developed a machine that we were ready to start marketing, even though it, was still, it still needed a lot of development at that point. Uh, but the, the market has grown, and you've created all these new lateral markets. Uh, tell me about the military and uh, it's a, it's, government. And it's really you know, it's, it's really strange all of the different applications. I mean, we have hovercraft operating in gold mines where they they're used to uh, retrieve birds and to survey mud flats. We have them being used in the mouth of the Mississippi where they're reconstituting barrier islands that have been washed away. We have them operating out in Utah where they're doing salt saltwater surveys on on very high elevation lakes. They're used for flood rescue, used very good for ice rescue, used all over the world for doing survey, um, various complicated surveys when you can't get into a place with a conventional vehicle. Um, also, we've sold a great number in Russia for duck hunters and fishermen and ice fishermen. They're excellent for those sorts of applications for outdoor. So it's a very, very broad application, a uh, huge number of, of uses. The biggest problem, is that very few people actually are aware that technology exists. Now, I want to come back. You had mentioned something about racing, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chris is a, a, an expert in his own right because you're an author of a couple different books. Mm -hmm. uh, you teach the uh, safety classes. But you were also involved in the very first hovercraft race, I heard. I was. So we're, I participated. The first race actually took place in Australia in 1964. And it was an unusual thing. It was the Royal Aeronautical Society in Australia were opening a new lake called Burley Griffin, which was the, the, in the capital of Australia. Burley Griffin, by the way, is an American. He designed the Australian capital city. And they were commemorating the opening of the lake and they wanted to do something unusual. So they came up with the idea of having a hovercraft race. And people from all over Australia just showed up with these these machines. It was like those magnificent men in their flying machines. They're all these <laughs> junky machines. Some of them sank and some of them turned over and some of them wouldn't work and it was a, an amazing event. And, it, and that's, that was in 64 uh, and from that uh, the, the whole racing scene has actually expanded and it's extremely popular in Europe. Yeah, now, which brings me back to, I know you're, you ship your hovercraft to, to Europe all over in Germany and England and we're talking about Russia and what percentage of your sales would you say are in the U.S.? See, the way it works is it just depends on where the awareness is. If, the, if, you, if all of a sudden something happens in Russia and you've got a really aggressive salesman or you find there's some publicity there or something, you'll get a burst of sales. And at some, some years, 60% of our manufacturing craft here have been exported. And we do, our best year is about 60 units, so we're doing around 40 to 60 units a year at the moment. Okay. And, and for people that want to know, price range, I mean, you've got two-seaters, four-seaters, six-seaters, right. 20, 25,000, all the way up to 60, 65. Well, actually, you can, 
if you want to put it together yourself, it as, takes, a, as a kit, a kit. Yeah, it takes about 40 man hours to assemble a basic kit, and a, a basic kit's around about 15, okay. 15 to 16,000, and then you can start building more and more elaborate craft, and you can start putting in things like GPS and, and colour schemes, and, and the more things you add to it, cabins, windshield wipers, radios, sirens, then the price just goes up. You really pimp them out. Yes. You can add all kinds of lights yeah. and all kinds of stuff. No, sorry. Uh, I was out in the fiberglass shop looking at the different stages before it gets into the manufacturing building. Uh, and at what stage does the kit stop? I mean, you kind of start out with, tell, tell me about the, the, yes. the pieces, if you will. Well, that's, a, that's a good question because uh, a lot of kits, like go, uh, hot rod kits, for example, you've got to do a heck of a lot yeah. of work. But to answer your question, it's... It's no, it, there's no fiberglass work or anything. You, it's all bonded together. All you have to do is fit the skirts, put the engine in, put the controls, put the instruments. Okay, so, so it's you, you here, you build the, what, what do you call it, the floor or the base? The, the hull. The hull. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, the then you fiberglass the body. Mm -hmm. And the guys were showing me how two people can just pick it up. Yes, it's a yeah. flying machine. Weight is very important. It's a flying machine, and, and it is. We'll come back to that in just a second. So that's assembled. Um, and then it's all put together and it's ready for the skirt, it's ready for the motor and all oh, that. You have to fit those things. You, you've mentioned both we were talking before being on camera and then since we've been on camera that this is more like flying than driving a boat. Is that correct? Actually, I've had, we, we've trained more than a thousand people and, and a lot of those people are, uh, they come from all walks of life, so there's, there's uh, aviation people, there's um, helicopter people, there's boating people, there's children, there's everything you can imagine. And the helicopter people say it's more like heli uh, flying a helicopter than it is a boat. So if you put a boat here and a helicopter there, it's more like the helicopter. The only thing is, you're flying with one foot on the ground, so it's much safer than a helicopter. And the drop is a lot less. <laughs> and that's really what got me into it, because I was interested in flying, and, and when I was young, a lot of my friends had been killed flying, were killed. Mm. And I, and I thought, boy, you know, flying's a bit dangerous, and this is like flying with one foot on, your, on the ground. I like to step out. Yeah, but because you can go sideways, you can spin forward, backward. That's right. And, then, and, and what you need to be trained is, because in the hands of a novice, hovercraft are magnetically attracted to all obstacles. They'll just hit whatever's there. <laughs> so it really is like flying a helicopter. You have to be trained to, to operate. And that's what all this is all about. This is what happens when you come here for the training. And, and you don't just hand someone the keys. There is a training process. It usually takes a full day. And we like to, to actually get people to do the training before they even consider buying a hovercraft. It, it's really more like okay. buying an airplane. You don't normally go and buy an airplane. You start out by learning to fly, and and that's the way we think this should work. It's, it's not like getting a jet ski. You should learn to fly, and if you're interested in it, then the next step would be thinking about either getting a kit or a hovercraft, rather than just coming and buying a hovercraft and then discovering, oh, wait a minute, this is a little this challenge. Is like, this is like driving a car on ice. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't touched upon your most recent one, though. Well... <clears throat> So anything, I mean, what, what we're talking about is getting exposure. And the, the difficulty with a small company is ex getting exposure is the same as education. And everyone knows education is very costly. So you have to rely on things like Junkyard Wars or, or um, James Bond or something like that. If you, if you can get into something like that, that spreads the news. And that, it doesn't necessarily sell hovercraft immediately, but it plants the seed. And recently we were contacted, we get a lot of nuts calling up for Australia. <laughs> we were contacted by a nut who wanted to uh, use a hovercraft on a golf course. And it took us a while to figure it out, but Philip, our salesman here, uh, sales manager, was able to figure out that what they were really trying to do is come up with a, with a viral video. And this was to sell clothes for Oakley. And so, and they had Bubba Watson involved. Uh, and they just sponsored and uh, wanted or taken him on as, as um, one of their clients. And then it, it all came together. And, we, and I knew hovercraft worked really well on golf courses because we used to race them on golf courses. So it, we were able to take our existing design and convert it and turn it into an uh, equivalent golf 
golf cart. And then it became a viral video. So that's like James Bond. You see, got it out there, planted the seed. Seven, eight million views on you YouTube. It. It's on national TV networks. A lot of interest in it. And it sparked all sorts of other things as a result. We've we sold a, a few golf carts, but we've had other things. We're doing golf uh, tournaments and we've just done one down in Florida um, last week and down in Miami. So th th these are the sorts of things that have come out and it's it's just creating the awareness, that's what it's doing. Which is a good thing. How many controls are there? Well, you don't have a, have a steering wheel. No, there's no steering wheel. You could put a steering wheel, but, but actually the way it works is you have a throttle, so you, you have a fan that does the lifting, and that fan, one third of the air that's coming out of that fan goes underneath the hovercraft to lift it, and the remaining two thirds push it along. So once it's lifted, you have a throttle, it lifts up, and about 3,000 RPM it'll start to slide forward because the, the air that's coming out the back's pushing you along. Then you have a rudder, which you could use as steering wheel, but because our craft have reverse thrust as well, and we're the only company in the world that have that capability, um, you turn the, the rudder this way, and then on the rudder controls there are, like motorcycle grips, they're actually BMW controls, and when you pull these you can actually operate reverse thrusters, so you can go backwards, you can spin the craft, you can spin it as fast as you like, in fact so fast it can throw you out. So you can spin it from left to right, and you can put the throttle, the rudder, and the um, reverse buckets all together in one operation and on top of that you've got the weight balance remember I moved the coins around well you've got to move the seats backwards and forwards while you're actually operating it to keep the craft level because as it's spinning everything is changing all these different forces that are on the craft keep changing it's dynamic controls then that's right everything like a helicopter <laughs> <laughs> like a helicopter except you don't go up very high you go up nine inches that's right that's right <laughs> well that's great um i'm looking forward we're going to go out here in a couple days and uh, take a ride uh, we're going to see if the uh, lake's still frozen and uh, we're going to try some different things uh, in a couple of your uh, craft yep and yep. I'm, I'm looking forward to that it will be fun well, we're out on a unique experience today here on Indiana Outdoor Adventures. As you can see back behind me, Lake Monroe is frozen. And it hasn't been like this for what you say, three years? About three years. Joining us today is uh, Steve Stafford. And Steve has been kind enough to take us out in his hovercraft. Now, for a unique experience on a lake, a hovercraft is the way to do it. Steve, tell me a little bit about how you got involved with hovercrafts and uh, what it is you like about them. Uh, I like the feeling of flying. It's like flying with one foot on the ground. Okay. If you're going to crash, you're only going to fall nine inches. You only got to go so that far. That's, that's right. And so the, the hovercraft, uh, we, we talk about it f being like flying. It's more like a helicopter than a boat. It is. It, you're flying on a cushion of air, so the dynamics are more related to flying a helicopter than it is as a watercraft. It, it, you don't have a steering wheel. What kind of controls does it take to operate one? Uh, this craft has a rudder control. Uh, it works like a handlebar that controls your rudders. Uh, twist grip throttle and the reverse thrusters are controlled individually by a hand grip on each handlebar. Okay, and I know that the air, we, we've got a actually an airplane motor on this thing. Yes, um, it's a ultralight aircraft engine. It's um, it's a hearth that's made in Germany. And you got a third of the power of the air going to providing a lift. Correct. And two thirds giving you thrust. That's correct. Now, we were out a little bit ago and uh, the thrust kind of went like this. Tell me about some of the maneuvers you can do. Uh, with, with the controls that are set up on this craft, uh, you can do 360s. You can uh, pirouette as many times as you want, keeping the same heading. Can, can you go backwards? You can fly in reverse. Okay. Uh, you're, this is the only hovercraft that's manufactured that has uh, efficient braking, and you can use that for spinning, uh, hovering in place. Uh, we do 180s. Now, Steve, we've got uh, a frozen lake. W when it's water, you can still go out on it. What kind of surfaces can you go on, or what kind of limits do you have? You can go anywhere. You can maintain an air cushion. It's uh, And it doesn't have to be hard. It can be water. It can be water. It'll go on land, ice, snow, mud, sand. Uh, 
you, you go across stuff you would normally sink in and it's, you're not affected. Now, be, because we, it, it's fiberglass and it, you've got a bottom and the shell, if you're out on open water and you cut the power and you lose your cushion of air, you're not going to sink. No, it, it is a full flotation, so. It becomes like a boat. It becomes a boat. A lot of people use them as uh, duck hunting platforms or for fishing, uh, and you can get in spots you normally couldn't get to with the regular boat. So you don't have to maintain that air cushion when you get to where you want to go. No. Yeah, yeah. Now we've gone over a lot of those different surfaces today. Uh, like I said, being out on the, the frozen lake uh, really added its uniqueness. A as, a, as a hobbyist, someone who wants to get involved with hovercraft, well, well, give me a sales pitch about why, what's, what's the excitement, what, what's the reason for wanting to try it? Uh, why not? <laughs> uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of places you can go and explore that you couldn't normally go in a normal boat. Uh, you hit a sandbar, or you find the logs across the river, you can hover right over the top of them and keep going. So. What kind of limitations do you have for what you can go over? We have a nine inch hover height on, on these machines and you can usually clear anything that you know is not exceeding that. And once you learn what you're doing, there are ways to get over stuff that is higher than that. Okay. So. Like when we were out on the lake today, there were places where the ice had kind of buckled uh, and some of it you were able to go right across. Some I know you slowed, braked, went over, got a little extra lift out of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, now we were able to clear some of those. Right, and that's all part of the training of, yeah. of learning, the experience of learning how to do it. I got to tell you, I liked having the cabin uh, on your hovercraft today. Uh, Cole, a member of our pro staff, uh, was in the other hovercraft that did not have a big windshield, uh, and he was filming and got the full brunt of uh, our what 25 degree temperatures. I don't know what the wind chill is today. Uh, so Cole, thanks a lot for what you put up with. <laughs> um, but there are times when your actual cabin uh, comes off and you become a convertible. Yes. For when you take the family out in the summertime. That's correct. Great. Yeah. Well, Steve, we've had a really good time out today on Lake Monroe, uh, getting the full impact of what it's like to ride in and experience a hovercraft. So thanks very much for no taking problem. us out today. Anytime. Great. Joining me today on our uh, unique adventure, uh, Cole Fisher, one of our pro staff members, uh, was along to help man one of the cameras. And Cole, you got to go out on wind-swept uh, uh, air through in your face, uh, trying to film from a hovercraft. What was it like today? Uh, cold. Cold. You, you nailed it. Um, Joe did just about anything we could possibly do out here. Uh, 360s. We'd stop, plant, take off. Um, it was. Uh, it was. It was neat. You know, typically when you're out here on the lake. You're in a boat, you're in the water. Um, to actually be a, above ice, yeah. uh, it's a totally different experience. Um, you know, it's it's something that, that not too many people could ever say they've done. And, and you've never been on a hovercraft before, have you? No, sir. I have. I never have either. I, I remember as a kid building a, a little one and just thought it was the coolest thing ever. But now that I've ridden in one, that's probably the coolest thing ever. Yeah, it's definitely a different experience. You, you've got uh, the force uh, from the from the fan itself and the hovercraft to, to levitate you above uh, above the ice. So it's 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 totally different than anything you ever experienced. I mean, we went across rocks and and sand and dirt and ice and water, and they put us through the paces. I think today. Yeah, I don't, I, there's there's probably not anything else that they've done out here that we didn't get to do today. So it was definitely uh, an experience of a lifetime. Great. That's all for today. Thanks for joining us on Frozen Lake Monroe, Experiencing Hovercrafts. We'll see you next time, right here on Indiana Outdoor Adventures.